We don't believe in our own value. Episode 167. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enix Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for building an architecture practice that allows you and empowers you to do your best work more often. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, the leading architecture firm consultancy for architects that helps firm owners structure their practice and their teams for freedom, creative fulfillment, and financial reward. Let me ask you a question. Are architectural services commoditized? Are architectural services commoditized? Have architectural services become commoditized? Here's the problem. It isn't uncommon for clients to undervalue architectural services, to undervalue what it is that we do as architects. And when they don't value it, they don't want to pay for it. This leads to a race to the bottom and unrealistic and hard to meet expectations from clients. Today, I'm joined by Ryan Willard. After training at London's Bartlett School of Architecture and a successful career as an architect, Ryan Willard joined the Business of Architecture team. He's currently our Director of Consulting and Business Transformation. On this episode, Ryan and I discuss, and you'll discover, three reasons why architectural services get commoditized and what you can do to prevent it so that you are compensated and respected fairly for your work. Hello and welcome, Architect Nation. Enix here is here, and today I'm joined with... Ryan Willard. Hello, Ryan. Hello, Enoch. How are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. So the topic that we'll speak, be speaking about today is a, a question that we want to pose to you, our listener. The question is, have architectural services become commoditized? Right? So, Ryan, what do we mean when we use the word commoditized? Let's first of all define what we mean by that. It means that we've become an a, a kind of indistinguishable service from anything else right or it's a i mean if, if we if we look at the stock market for example what are commodities typically on the stock market yeah produce i mean rice wheat uh petroleum uh things like that things that have zero differentiation they're just ba- they're just bought and sold based upon their price Exactly, exactly. So they become indistinguishable from one another. What's the difference between the gasoline that you'll get from Shell versus BP? Don't know. What causes the fluctuation in those prices? Well, lots of other economic forces. And as a market, you're always with those kinds of commodities, you as a consumer, you don't really care where it comes from necessarily. You're just looking, you're just valuing it based on its price. And it's a race to the bottom. And it's there's no other way for it to go. It's the lowest common denominator. People just buy on price. Now, you, you mentioned something interesting, Ryan, which is the idea of gasoline. I think that's great because if you look at savvy companies that are in commodity markets, mm-hmm. they go through great efforts to actually differentiate their commodities. So the key here is that it is possible to differentiate a commodity because I know that Chevron here in the United States, which is a gasoline station, a petrol station, they have something called Tecron. So you go, they, they flout this wonderful Tecron. The commercials talk about how it cleans out your pistons. I don't know if it's any different than the gasoline they sell at mm. AMPM or BP. Well, th- that, that's really interesting because, yeah, petrol is a, or petrol as we call it here in the UK, it is an interesting one because the, the companies, to what they end up doing is they try and create a different type of customer experience or you get bonuses for loyalty points. Right. So your your overall running costs become lowered um, if you keep on shopping, if you keep on buying your petrol with BP because you're getting your your loyalty cards or the stations themselves become more of a customer experience. And they have these collaborations with, you know, television chefs and, you know, it, it becomes like a gasoline station, but it's got a little restaurant and a little cafe and, you know, there's a waitrose there and it becomes it starts to differentiate the experience becomes differentiated and that kind of create and then obviously you see on the on the tv that um the those kind of companies make big efforts to associate themselves with other sorts of um activities or philanthropic endeavors or the 
the need to be perceived to be green or doing something good, which is very little to do with the actual product itself, if you like. And the real thing that drives the price of those sorts of commodities obviously is, some, is supply and demand. So here in the UK, what happened, the prices just a few weeks ago, the prices of gasoline went sky high because everybody thought there was a shortage because the media, the media reported that BP were worried about a shortage and then everyone freaked out, started filling up their cars and then it basically put a, an immediate strain on the whole system and the, the, pet, the petrol stations went empty and no one, could, no one could get petrol. And what it meant was that the guys who did have petrol could, you know, for the, for the first time, they could, you know, really hike up the price. But during COVID, for example, when there was lockdown, nobody was driving and the price starts to drop. So it's very interesting because what we see is that even within commodity markets, in the most basic commodities, and I think the most popular one ever would be Coca-Cola, right? Mm. So what's Coca-Cola? It's basically it's sugar water with a bit of flavoring in it. Now, some people might disagree, right? But look what Coke has done to be able to build a brand. So we can talk a little bit later about how to, how to battle commoditization. How do we know, Ryan, how do we, if we were going to answer the question, what would we be experiencing? What would be some of the symptoms that we would be experiencing in our practice that might cue us into the fact that perhaps we're being perceived as a commodity? What would be some of the things that we could, if we're experiencing, we could say, yep, I, I have a feeling that I might be being perceived as a commodity. We're in, we're, we're on the price game. The price game, meaning? Meaning that we're losing jobs because of price. Somebody's underbid us. That's our a big one. Our, you know, prospects are saying to us, you know what? Um, somebody else down the road, Joe Bloggs Architects, they said that they could do the same thing and it's half, it's half the price. Oh, okay. Why, so, why are you so expensive? That, so that people, kind of conversation. Yeah. So when it kind of, when the, when it revolves around the fee, so if we're losing projects based upon our fee, that could be a sign that we're being commoditized. I, I, I think any kind of bidding process as well really is setting it up for commoditization. So we look at um, practices that do a lot of work with institutions and education and you know, public procurement process. That's a, a kind of um, buying system that large institutions have installed in order to ensure that architecture is a commodity because yeah. they want to make sure they get the cheapest price. Yeah. So if, if you're listening and you're experiencing any of the things we're listing off here, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're being perceived as a commodity or that you are, but these could be warning signs. You probably want to take a hard look and have, have a hard inner look at your practice and try to figure out to what extent you are being perceived as a commodity. So there's the fee. The other thing would be, I would say, Ryan, if people are comparing you to other firms, mm. Right. If people are comparing you to other firms, because let's face it, when I walk into an Apple store, if I'm going for an Apple product, like an iPhone, for instance, I'm not comparing it with a Samsung. It's not even within my realm of, of consideration because I don't really see iPhones as commodities. I see them as specialty items. Right. So that, that could be another one. So number one, we're talking about if you're losing projects based on fee. Number two, it could be if you find yourself being compared with other architecture firms. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Which which goes back to that point about the, you know, the public procurement or tenders where it's being set up as a comparison. Yeah, it's been, absolutely. It's, been, it's like, and, you know, three three people were invited to bid. Let's have a look at what their prices are. Let's compare them. Let's You know, right, there's probably nothing as disheartening uh, as an architect to have your experience, your expertise, your education, your knowledge of mm -hmm. architecture and the craft of architecture, your knowledge of the codes, the entire body of knowledge, plus your creativity to be devalued by clients uh, to a mere number on a piece of paper and mm -hmm. to have them shop it around, compare it with other firms. I mean, that it's just, it, it's almost a slap in the face of the years of experience that you've had as an architect uh, to to be treated that way, and a lot of times clients don't realize it because they're they're brought up with the consumer mentality that we just shop things around. And when I say consumer, 
If you're doing residential, that would be the consumer. If you're if you're business to business, if you're doing institutional work, it would be these vendors and the buyers and the purchasing agents, and it'd be the the uh, facility managers and the people that you deal with. So here's here's a story that I'll kick this off with. Ryan, as we jump into the rest of the conversation here, this was a, a story that was sent to us. It's probably not too uncommon about what happens quite frequently, and we hear these kind of stories all the time. This was sent in by one of our architects, and I'm just going to summarize this. Say, So this architect uh, was invited to a meeting with a general contractor that he wants to work with, as well as his favorite local restaurant. So seemed like a pretty exciting project. Says that he was vibrating with exuberance and basically was able to put together, help them seal the deal for a design build project. So big win, super happy. Uh, he said, I onboarded the project. I held my kickoff meeting with the client and my design team set everything in motion. And then dot, dot, dot. He says, and then the contractor called. The contractor called. He told me that after I'd helped them seal the deal for this restaurant, they'd gotten another price. price. Again, there we go. That was roughly 20% of my price. It didn't include the level of services as my, as mine. Uh, and I searched for the firm and found nothing at all, but they wanted me to strip my offer into something more like theirs. I peeled back a few levels of service that I didn't mind compromising on, peeled back some fee, and sent their revised agreement. They politely declined, and I understood. So here we have an example of an architect being put through the ringer. I mean, completely put through the ringer. Not Ouch. only did this architect go out and do a lot of free work up front in terms of putting this deal together, getting the project going. I've heard this story hundreds of times. Architects put deals together. They're instrumental in getting projects taken on. Uh, the clients kind of have them do all this free work. There's like a carrot in front of them. And then at the end of the day, they shop it around. They end up not getting the project. and. Not only did they not get the project, but they're trying to negotiate you down. They make you do all the work of negotiating and revising your fee, and then they still tell you no. So this is a good example of what made me buy commodity. There was no loyalty of the GC. There was no loyalty. Maybe there was the GC, but ultimately it was the client calling the shots. There was no loyalty there. They were shopping around his services, and they saw it as no differentiation between him and this other firm that he couldn't even find online. Who knows? Maybe they made it up. Maybe it's someone in their basement. Who knows? Ever heard a story like this before, Ryan? Many. <laughs> many, it's, many. It's a travesty and it's a shame. So let's talk about, so there's a, a great example. When I say great, I mean, it's, it's a sad example, but there's an example that's textbook commodity, right? So we'd love to hear your commodity stories. If you can send them in, send them into support at businessofarchitecture.com or podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. We love to get those. So we've put together three reasons why firms get commoditized, Ryan, and we're going to talk about what to do to prevent it. Yeah. Okay. So our number one, would you want to go ahead and tell us what's what's our number one well, num reason why architects number, are feeling commoditized? Number one is that we're operating in a mature and saturated market and there's a huge amount of other competing businesses um, and professionals and contractors builders surveyors technologists a lot of other people in the same space who aren't necessarily architects who are all doing the same thing or providing the same results um, and i think that we've got to be really aware of of the of that we've got to be really aware about the fact that it is a it is a very mature market and that in many times the sorts of projects that we're going after aren't the right sorts of projects in the first place what do you mean that they're they're kind of below they're not you know they're not the caliber of project that we should be going after mm -hmm. um they are projects where somebody's just interested in you know the price game, if you like. So being able to target a niche or understand a specialist problem and to be very focused on that uh, and being able to go after clients proactively as opposed to being reactive, which is often what happens is that as architects, you know, the businesses, you know, we're focused on delivery, we're focused on designing, we're focused on 
operations in the business and if we just do good work then business will come to us now that is true that does happen it just happens that it's not always the, the type of work that we want or is best for us and we can get caught if you like in in a in serving clients that aren't the best fit for us, which means that we become more vulnerable to being perceived as a commodity. Yeah, if there's a mismatch there. Ryan, I want yeah. to take a couple of steps back. And when we talk about this idea of mature and saturated market, I, I think everyone knows what saturated means. It means there's a lot of, there's a lot of people offering mm. similar things to what we do in the market. So there's a lot of competition. But when we talk about maturity of markets, I want to quickly go back. There's something called the five levels of market sophistication. And this was originally came up by a guy named Eugene Swartz. And what, what Eugene talked about as he, he looked at different businesses, how they progressed and, and the market factors that affected them, they go through these different stages, right? So level one would be the pioneer stage. This is where a market is relatively new. You've come out with a completely new product and there's zero competition for you. So you just show up on the scene, you say, hey, I'm here, and everyone flocks to you, and you're a, you, you have a monopoly on the market, right? So that's, that's level one. Obviously, architects are not at that stage. Now, these market levels, they progress, and there's different ways of differentiating yourself as you go through these different stages. For instance, stage number two is now if another person comes on the scene, let's say you're the pioneer, you're the first person that's come out with this, you're the only architect in town. If another architect opens up shop across town and you're competing directly, then the next stage of competition is going to be you saying we're better, we're faster, we're more experienced, you're, you're something-er, you're faster, you're better, right? So companies begin to compete upon this basis. Now, when you go to the last market of, of um, market sophistication, as you mentioned, it's a it's a, what we would call a red ocean, meaning that there's so many competing options that people who are purchasing are completely confused in terms of differentiation and it becomes a pure commodity game. Now, the companies that are able to succeed in that arena do the things that they would need to do to differentiate themselves in a commodity market because the market has become very commoditized. Yeah. So that's what we mean by a mature market, meaning that architecture has been around for a very, very long time. It's a relatively known service, meaning people know what it is. It has a certain mindset in the consumer or the purchaser's eyes. And so this, there's a lot of forces driving it into a commodity. Yeah. Right. What is the solution to a being in a mature and saturated market? Well, it's interesting kind of going back to that, what the ideas of the mature, yep. of the mature market as well. And, you know, part and parcel of that is, is that they're already dominant players that have been well-established in yeah. in the market which also means that as a new as a new business you're often in competition with you know lots of other people who have been doing the same thing for generations in some cases and, yeah. and as a mature practice you may be getting annoyed competing with these upstarts that have little overhead and are undercutting your fees yeah yeah wow so it's really is what do they call it eating your own young <laughs> I mean, there's a bit of that happening in our industry, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay. So what do we do? We're in a saturated market. We can't really change that. We're in a mature market. We can't change that. We can influence it though. And we can create our own, our, we can create our own localized market. Yeah. And I think one of, one of the sort of antidotes, if you like, this idea of the, of the red ocean and the blue ocean is is number one kind of finding finding our niches and being able to understand our clients pain points and their problems and being able to art articulate those very clearly that starts to give us an edge but really like from a more general perspective it's it's not being reactive with our sales and marketing and the one thing that in our practices that can't be commoditized is our leadership correct right our vision yeah so vision and leadership so tell me what do you mean when you say vision and leadership so the stand that we're making the mission that we're on the the values that we kind of the, the firm is built on the message of the practice the personality of the practice yes. you know yeah, the, that's beautiful the, the kind of the flavor the thing that you know you as an individual cannot be commoditized your personality the way that you communicate you know your 
your expression, if you like. Um, these things become much harder to to replicate, and you know you, you don't need a massive a massive audience, if you like, but you do need a kind of following of a few very committed people who 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 buy into that or whose values are aligned with yours so yeah and, and and again that kind of being clear on that and taking the time in your business to articulate things like core values the purpose of the business the the mission of the company so starting to develop a mission led business and thinking about where you want to go and what's the what's the impact you want to create in the world what's the change that you want to facilitate what do you want to use the business for so there's that big big vision wanting to create or there's the being more practical what's the specific problem that you want to be solving for people what's the yeah then we come to leadership yeah right so it, you, let's say you're solving a problem leadership is about let's face it leadership a large part of leadership is being visible mm. Right. So when we talk about how to deal with being in a mature and saturated market. There's an element there is that if you're in that kind of market, you need to be the most visible. Now, that doesn't mean the most visible to everyone because you want to be invisible to the clients you don't want to work with. And you want to be highly visible to the clients you do want to work with. And so this is leadership, right? A leader doesn't sit back and reactively wait for things to happen. The leadership, the leader takes initiative spreads the message is an evangelist of sorts. So out there being seen. So this is important. If you're in a saturated mature market, which we are as architects, it's essential. If you want to get out of the commodity trap, you need to take the leadership and being seen. Yeah. Being seen. And as Brian mentioned, not just being seen as another architect, but when you couple this with the vision, that's when you start to be seen as something unique and different that can command a premium and do away with, all this price shopping, beating you down on price, not getting paid for your creative efforts that that we see so very often. Yeah. Ryan, any other thoughts on on point number one? No. I before think, we move on to our second point I, here, I think that's I think that's a good little summary. Okay, good. Now, our second point or our second reason why architecture firms find themselves commoditized is that there's little to no understanding on our side as architects of our clients perception of value in other words how our clients value things we have little to no perception of how our clients value things and so what we mean when we say this is that a lot of times when we go out there and we're communicating and, and we're taking leadership as we as we see in our eyes communicating to our clients we're telling our clients the things that we think are important and we're trying to convince our clients what we think are important. And we're not putting it in our clients. Uh, we're not basically walking in our clients' moccasins or our clients' shoes to see what is it that might, how do my, how do my clients see these issues? And ultimately, what is very important to my clients? Mm. Right? It's sort of, I'll give an example. If I were going to go to the dentist and the dentist is telling me about how he has the latest tools. He invests in the latest drills. So, so let's say I go there because my teeth have yellowed over time and they're a little bit, you know, they're a little crooked and I would like to straighten up my teeth and get them nice and shiny, nice and white. If I go in there and if the dentist just spends time telling me about his specific way that he likes to use this particular drill that he has, interesting. I mean, I might be interested as you know, so I'm going to drill this perfectly round hole in your tooth you know, to fix that. And then we're going to pour some of this, this, you know, special epoxy in there and we're going to fill that over and then we're going to grind it down and you're going to have lots of sawdust in your mouth, but don't worry, we'll squirt it out with some water and then we'll suck it out at the end. Right now, if I go to another dentist and that dentist speaks to me, he says, well, Enoch, you've probably been dealing with this for a while. And you know, what we often find is that people are conscious about their smiles and pictures and they look back and they, they're just eyes gravitate towards their teeth. And it makes them not to want to smile as much, right? And we know that when you don't smile as much, you actually feel sadder and more depressed. They've shown that if you walk around with a smile on your face, it affects how you feel inside. Okay. Now he's starting to speak into my perspective, mm. 
my language of how I see things and about how I rule the what um, you know my experience about how I see the world. Okay, so what might be an architectural example of this, Ryan? Well, I I, I certainly think that many architects are interested. Their main interest in interest is in design, and Correct. they will and and and. Some things like sustainability, for example, yes. which again, these are important things, but we just need to understand how that might be framed for the client, right? So I'm going to rudely interrupt you here, Ryan, and I'm going to say with design, I've heard it said once that clients see design as a noun, architects see design as a verb. Interesting. Yes. Yeah. Right. So, so for clients, often the, the design is, you know, maybe, maybe secondary and maybe that there's things going on in their own lives that are much more, what's the word, kind of pertinent in the project. Brilliant. Brilliant. So I think it was Daniel Kahneman who won the Nobel Prize. He said, when in, in any situation where there's an exchange of value, in other words, a selling situation, he says, the price doesn't matter as much as how you present your services and the price, right? So ultimately, the fee that architects charge isn't as important. Now, we think it is. We think it's highly important because we feel that way because clients have beat us down over time. But it's not as important as the way that we present our services and those fees. And so that's what I'm hearing, Ryan, as you're talking about this right now, is I'm hearing you're saying that the way we present it, you're talking specifically about the way we present it, understanding what it is that our clients care about and presenting what we do in a way that resonates with them, yeah. not necessarily a way that resonates with other architects or with us. Yeah, absolutely. And this is a little bit being like, you know, a therapist in a way. It means listening very deeply to what the client is actually saying not what we want them to say or what we think they're saying but actually being able to listen and read between the lines if you like ask probing questions about how you know what's what's happening in somebody's life why is it important for them to be doing this project right now yeah because that's the key and because and also recognizing that say for example in a sales conversation we might ask that question but we only ever get an intellectual or superficial answer to it. You know, why do you want to do this project, Mr. Client? And they'll say something, I want more light and space. But then on, on a further inquiry and probing, like why is that light and space important to you? And then it's like, well, actually, we've been living in this house for 25 years and it hasn't been working. And actually, you know, I feel like the kids, when they come home, they go straight to their bedrooms and then they're just on their you know, they're just on their iPhones and we don't get to eat and communicate as a family anymore. And, you know, there's a, there's a lot of stuff happening there. And often when people are making a change to their house, let's use residential as an example, it's often a trigger from a big lifestyle change or a life or a life event that's happening. Maybe having children or maybe children have grown up and now left and, there's a there's a void there there's a gap like how do we want to live so and right. and these are the things that are really important to our clients and and i know a lot of you know a lot of architects do get to this um you know they they do they they're good at getting this stuff out from clients they're good at understanding it and, and it's part of the, the the design process but it's also part of the sales process is to be able to listen to what are the problems of the client? Like what, what, you know, what are their complaints? What's not working about their house right now? And why, why is that a problem? And not being afraid to ask why several times, even if it appears like a stupid, a stupid question. Um, cause, exactly. cause, cause they're in, they're in lies, you know, some, something emotional, but cause we have, we have, a, we have a tendency cause if we're, to then talk about our own services. Here's our, here's my portfolio of work. Here's what we do. And we wish we want so very badly for the architects, for the, you know, for the client to look at the projects and be like, we want to hire this architect because their work is so amazing. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I think that's right. And I think that's a little bit of a it's a it's a bit of wishful thinking and it's kind of, you know, part and parcel of our as our training as architects where we put design at the for forefront of everything. Correct. Correct. A lot of our a lot of our clients, whether we do institutional work or whether we're working with individuals, consumers, families, uh, these are these are generally they're not they're not design professionals. Right? Now, when I used to do architecture full time, I actually loved working for hospitals that had architects on staff because they understood it. They got it. There was a different conversation happening, right? Most clients don't have that expertise or training. And so the challenge here is we look at challenge number two, which is the problem is that we have little to no understanding of the way that our clients present value. The solution here is to be able to align our services and our value with the way that our clients perceive it. So we have to figure out why do clients, what do they really value? And then we need to figure out a way. To, this is where we exert our leadership. That's what leaders do is we show them how our services and the way that we would approach the project aligns with what they already want to do. Mm. Right now, this doesn't mean that there's not some influence that we can maybe change their mind a little bit or tweak them or come up with a new solution, but ultimately it needs to be based in the things that the client values. Okay. So number three, Ryan, number three, Number three reason, this is reason number three, why your services, our services as architects may be commoditized. We don't believe in our own value. Really? What do you mean? I mean, every day on, on Twitter, on Facebook, I hear architects saying that it's the clients who don't see our value. Yes. Now, I, I, I think our actions speak louder than words here. Hmm. And what do you mean? If we find ourselves discounting our fees, um, you know, we're we're in that commodity race. We're trying to win. We're trying to win work. We're giving away things for free. We are actively devaluing ourselves. And I think that deep in our hearts, you know, we our architects do value themselves. They we do value what it is that we do, but in the process of running a business and the realities of being in a commercial world, we hear clients say to us, ask us questions, you know, asking us to reduce services. Why is this so expensive? This seems like an awful lot of work to do. Are you sure I need to do this? All these sorts of things. We start believing. Why is it going to take so long? Aren't you just copying and pasting from previous projects? I, I just need some drawings done, you know, yeah, I, it, it, it we begin to believe somebody else's f beliefs. Narrative. That, yeah, exactly. Yeah. We believe we start to believe somebody else's narrative, and then we start acting in alignment with somebody else's belief. Around. Yeah, I get it. I mean, it's it's tough. It's when you're out there and you're getting beaten down week after week after week, and you hear the same thing over and over again. People talking about telling you that they think you're expensive, telling you, wow, that's a lot more than I thought it was going to be telling you. Can I sharpen the pencil? You know, even having contractors having the ear of the client. And now the client comes back to you and says, well, my contractor said that you, you specified all these expensive things. There's a cheaper way to do it. And so we lose a bit of respect and trust from the clients. Like when this happens year after year after year, and it's, it's terrible, right? Mm. I mean, we talked to architects who've been doing this just yesterday. I was talking to an architect who's been doing this. I mean, opened up her practice the year I was born. I mean, so she's been doing this for 40 years. And, and, um, and, and just the, the, the element of, there's an element of being jaded. There's an element of being burnt out. There's an element of just cynicism when you've been dealing with it for so long, that's difficult to stand in the face of that. Right. And I just got an email the other day. I sent out an email to the business of architecture email list. And one of the lines in there was, I said, there's a list a mile long of why it's amazing and wonderful to be an architect. And one of the response I got back was an architect who basically said, I can only three, I, I can only think, you say there's a list a mile long. I can only think of three in my 40 years of practice. And even those are borderline acceptable. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just crushed. I was just like, oh, how, how sad, because that's not how we come out of school, right? We don't come out of school with this jaded 
cynical view. And so ultimately what happens is when we don't believe in our own value, we end up discounting ourselves mentally. We don't even realize it happens, right? We're, we're figuring out our fee for our project. And then we look at the fee and we think, wow, that's a lot of money. I think that might be too much. Maybe I should try to reduce that a little bit so it's not above the other side. I don't lose the project, right? Or the work gets done. We're looking at the invoice and we think, wow, that was a lot of hours that we spent doing that. I'm going to reduce the hours because I don't want to charge my clients. Like this is us discounting ourselves. It's not even clients telling us to discount. It's us discounting our perception. You know, I, this is interesting, Ryan. I was, um, we talk about this a lot. So actually, uh, another email that I sent out, I was talking about this idea of architects discounting themselves and architects having difficulty uh, producing the services and the high quality of design that they want within the scope that they're given, within the fee that they're given. Because here's the thing, as architects, we want to provide the best quality design as possible. We want to provide the best quality drawings. We know that it takes time and effort to do this. And when we, when we feel like the pressure to reduce our fees, then ultimately it makes it very difficult to run a practice when you're trying to meet these, these fees that we may have set under pressure. And so what was interesting is actually I sent out one of these emails kind of talking about this and a developer wrote back and he said, I'm surprised. I'm surprised I had no idea architects are dealing with this. He's like, my architect, he does free, you know, free site plans for me all the time. And he does free kind of test fits and free everything. And he said, I had assumed that he just ultimately rolls that into the price that he charges me when we do the project. Now, here's the key. Yes, there probably is a certain amount of that that's rolled into the project by the architect, but by and large, it's not. It's never recouped. They write it off as a marketing expense or they just take a loss. And ultimately, again, this puts downward pressure on the ability of architects to run a successful practice or an enjoyable practice, let's put it that way, when they're having to deal with cash flow issues and being devalued and this idea of being commoditized, right? So going back to point number three here is we don't believe in our own value. A lot of times over time, we've been so beaten down that we're not standing up for our own value. So our invitation today to you listening is let's turn the tide. Here at Business of Architecture, this is our mission. Our mission is to help thousands of architecture from owners stand up for their value, to be paid what they deserve for their creative effort, and to run businesses that they enjoy. Ryan, it's been great speaking, and we look forward to continuing the conversation. Yeah, Enoch, great points there. I think that makes a lot of a lot of sense, and I think if this is an, a, not an uncommon experience for architects to be feeling like they're commoditized. Um, and I think if anyone, anyone listening here is feeling the same, then continue. We're going to be continuing this conversation and, um, we want you to be part of it. And that is a wrap. Today's episode is sponsored by Smart Practice Business of Architecture step-by-step -step executive training program for firm owners who want a practice that gives them freedom, creative fulfillment, and financial reward. Because you see, likely it isn't your skill as an architect or your skill as a designer that holds you back in architecture. It's everything else related to running a business, redoing staff work, trying to find the right people, keeping the right people and keeping the money flowing so it all runs smoothly. If you're ready to stop reinventing the wheel, get a proven system and simplify the running of your practice, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash training to discover a free video where you'll discover the smart practice method for running a practice that doesn't get in the way of your architecture. As a reminder, the views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.